Ian, you were on your way to becoming a school teacher and you made a major left turn and found yourself smack dab in the middle of automotive world. Um, what happened there? That's not, uh, that's not always, that doesn't seem like a best next step uh, on paper. Well, the only person that didn't think I was going to be a school teacher was uh, my father. He, he basically, when I, what I basically was, I was going through uh, college and all the rest of it to become a school teacher and decided that, you know, if I became a school teacher, I was going to be with the same people doing the same thing for the rest of my life. Right. Um, I lived very near where Hawthorne's headquarters was in Australia. And so I applied for their trainee program. And of the 200 applicants they had, they took 20 and I was one of them. So I proudly went home that evening and I asked my father I was going to join the Ford Motor Company. And he said, well, I knew that. He said, you're never going to be a bloody teacher, quote my father. Um, and as I say, the rest of it, the rest is history. So... Um, What's interesting about that is I'm a passion, I'm very passionate about art and history and by taking the career choices I did and going internationally and doing all the things I've done, I've actually been able to indulge myself in my one of my passions to a degree that no one that was a school teacher would ever have been able to do. So yeah, I got the best of both worlds. Yeah, you did. Right. You did. Absolutely. And and, and the, the 1970s were an interesting time, especially at Ford. You had Lee Iacocca and you had Jack Nasser in the Australian division as well. Yep. I mean, later on became the CEO of the Ford Motor Company. I, so, I, worked with Jack. I, I worked with Jack at Ford Australia. So it was a very interesting time. And also what was really interesting about Ford Australia through the 70s and 80s was um, they were always number two to hold, which was General Motors. And yeah. then in, 19, in 1981, they finally beat them and became number one in Australia. And they were for many, many years after that. So uh, that was a real turning point in the company. And it was after 10 years with the company and, you know, we got to market leadership, I sort of started looking around saying, well, what's the next challenge? And that's when I made a career decision to go onto the agency side. I was in charge of marketing at Ford Australia. Um, and so in that year, the after, year after we got market leadership, um, five of us left the company. Um, a couple went into the agency business and a couple went off the client side. And two of my very closest friends, uh, one uh, in particular, went to Toyota uh, to uh, run marketing or advertising and money out of marketing at Toyota. And I ended up going to the agency that was their agency. So it was a very strange, strange environment. And that led to sort of a turning point in my career. So um, I joined the agency. I'm not going to name the agency, but... Um, I, it was the first agency I joined, and as you know, when you've been with a company for ten years or any company for a long time, the next place you go, you quite often don't stay very long because you, you just is, you don't know what to ask, you don't know what you what to uh, what to ask, what's wrong, what's right, whatever. I got a very bad feeling about this particular company not too early, about six months into it, and okay. basically there were some financial irregularities going on, and I got asked because of my connection to the people who were running the Toyota client. Um, to basically front something that was really irregular. And I was very uncomfortable about it and I sort of chewed on it for a few days and basically said, you know what, it's so, this is such an ethical lax. And, and these are, besides being my friend professionally, I just couldn't bring myself to do this. It, just, right. it right. didn't feel right. And at the end of the day, you know, you are who you are and how you're brought up. And I was brought up, my father had his own business, incredibly ethical. He, he's, he's, statement in life was if it's good for your client it will be good for you yeah so I, I, I believe that and so i uh i resigned um from the agency i just walked in and resigned and this is back before cell phones and all the rest of it so i lived about 45 minutes away from the office and so i resigned and got in my car and left and uh, i arrived home and my eight and a half month pregnant wife opened the front door and said what's going on? And I went, uh, I've resigned. She said, well, I do know that, but where are you going? I said, I don't know, but I'm sure I'll get something. And for her credit, you know, she had faith in me and I did. But um, what was very, what was fascinating about that particular circumstance is the week that I did that, um, DFS, which became Saatchi and Saatchi, had been asked by the Toyota clients in Australia to pitch the business. And they were, in fact, about to fire the agency I had just left. Interesting. Interesting, and, right. And my, my soon-to-be new client um, had a panic attack figuring there must have been an incredible leak somewhere, and I knew, uh, which I didn't. And, I, and, you know, it's fascinating how they went through to try and keep it secret anyway, but no, I won't get into that. But anyway, so um, I, I resigned, and this was so on a Thursday or a Friday, and I got a call at home 
from the agency that was going to absorb DFS in Australia to talk to them to talk to them about um, working on a, an oil camp, which was a strange thing. I said, yeah, I'll come and talk to you. So the next week I go and talk to them. Had a series of interviews, but in, in one of the interviews, this American guy sitting there saying nothing. He just introduced himself and never said a word through the entire interview. He was the representative of Dancer Fitzgerald Sample, which became Saatchi Saatchi, and he was to run the business. Oh, interesting. Okay. Right. And so he said, boss was in the room. My boss, my, as I did, had no... By the way, this man has become a lifelong friend. He's still a friend of mine. He's in his 80s now, lives near me. But um, long story short from this is um, they and finally, after a series of interviews, like it went on all week, I got, I got interviewed, I think, five different times for several hours, and they were asking a lot of questions. Um, they finally hired me, and they said, well, by the way... Um, uh, your eight, your previous agency is going to be fired and we're going to be the agency for, for Toyo. Like, oh, really? And she, he said, you're going to be the account director in charge of it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was the only person that was in, was hired by um, uh, DFS from the previous agency to work on the business. And because you made the right ethical decision to leave, right? Yeah. Because yeah. That, that, right. That, the, that and the fact that, you know, I, I obviously was doing a good job otherwise, but the fact that I'd taken the step that I had because what one of the reasons that the business had gone into review is the clients had worked out there was something really fishy going on about the same time as I did. Oh, okay, right. And that was one of the reasons. And so the fact that I stepped up and said, this is bullshit, I'm not taking this, really was a huge, you know, a huge you know, vote of confidence. And so I got that. And then I hired a couple of people from the previous agency who were very good. But um, that catapulted my career in a different direction altogether. Um, so I went on to the agency side. And ended up spending 15 years all over the world with Saatchi and Saatchi on Toyota. When I joined the Saatchi, or DFS and Saatchi had the business in the US, Canada, and Australia. When I left, we had it in over 20 countries. Wow. So, okay. you know, so it became a very, very important uh, company um, client for, for, for Toyota. So lots of wonderful things. Loved what I was doing there. And then um, I got headhunted out of uh, Saatchi's to join, rejoin Ford. And okay, can we, can we pause there for one second, Ian, if you don't mind? Yeah, because sure. I, I, want to just, I want to get into the other ones as well. We've got a lot to cover. But there are a lot of organizations right now that are laying off people. There are mm -hmm. a lot of organizations under pressure. They might put pressure on some key people, potentially. We hope not, but it could happen, to do some things that they might consider to be unethical. Mm -hmm. And maybe we could talk about that, the, the, okay. the importance of staying ethical. Mm -hmm. I would love to see, because I know you have some strong opinions on it. I mean, it really shaped your career to make that one pivotal decision amongst others. Yeah. So here's the thing. If you want to have a long career, you're yeah. going to get a, long, a lot of people on the way up and you're going to meet a, the same people on the way down. And you have to be true to who you are. And people have to know who you are. And trust, I think, is foundation. And part of trust is having ethical standards. And that's not to be stupid about things or be Pollyanna-ish, but the reality is that if, if, if there's something that, that really um, is against your ethical being, your ethical yeah. structure, you must take a stand. Now, you can be as dramatic as I was resigning or you can you know, try and change it. I tried to change their mind on this to tell them to come, come clean and do it, and they wouldn't. Okay. And so that's when I made the decision. So I tried to... You know, to, to move the situation, you know, and get them to, you know, do the right thing and they weren't going to do it. And that told me something about them as well. So uh, I think you really, um, you have to be true to yourself. Uh, yeah. I, I've been in this career for 50 years and I've got people that, you know, I've got Earl Gandell, the guy I just mentioned, who I've known for 48 years. Um, I still know my very first boss at the Ford Motor Company. So... Um, these are lifelong friends and these are people that, you know, I have a relationship with, but also they're people that know and trust me. And I've, you know, the fact that after, you know, all those years at Ford going to Saatchi's and then being asked to come back to Ford tells you something about the impression I made on the people at Ford about how I did business. Well, let's, let's go there because Ford kind of has had a boom-bust life cycle. Oh. <laughs> lots of booms, lots of busts, lots of turnarounds, having to bet the company, you know, bet on the company again and again. Where were you at when, when? Where were they at when you came back in? Uh, that's when Jack Nasser came over, uh, took over as CEO. He'd taken over about a year prior, so he was okay. a global CEO, and he actually remembered me from the time that uh, I was running marketing and he was running finance. 
at Ford in Australia. And um, he asked the recruiter to, you know, see if he could get me to join Ford. He wanted people to be changed. I've been a change agent my entire life. So they were looking for someone to come in and really change the way Lincoln Mercury did their marketing. Lincoln Mercury, okay. Lincoln Mercury specifically. And Lincoln Mercury was just a, a bloody mess. I've got to be got to tell you, it was just. Um, and the problem was with Ford is, um, you know, the, 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 you have all these lighters in there, and that, you have a lot of groupthink. I have to say that I've, I've bought, at each time I've ever dealt with Ford, either when I work within the company or as a client, because I do work with Ford now, they've got some of the brightest people I've ever met. Yeah. They, but they get into this groupthink, and they've got this layer of clay. It's the middle management. The people at the top are brilliant and know what needs to be done. And the people, the, the grunts at the bottom, know how to take orders and get stuff done. And then there's this layer of clay in the middle of the company that really gets in the way. And there's a lot of lifers in there. Um, and there's some people that just, you know, just basically, you know, picking the box each day as they, they turn up. And that's a problem that that company has. And it's not just unique to Ford. It's, lots of companies have this. The boom bust piece is interesting. Um, I think... Uh, what happens is the company gets complacent in its success and, you know, then it starts to fail, keeps trying to repeat mistakes until it has to finally do something dramatic to fix itself. It's the absolute polar opposite of a company like Toyota, who I've worked with a lot over the years, which is a company that never repeats a mistake. It learns from things. And the other thing that really impressed me when working with Toyota with the very early days of Toyota is that when they're successful, the meeting after that success is what could we do better? Whereas no, it's continuous, it's continuous, continuous improvement and continue and never satisfied, and you have to get into their mindset of never being satisfied. Whereas I do see many companies get very satisfied with, aren't we clever? And then you're clever until you're not. Right, 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 right. But and, you you saw that on the Jack. You also saw that on the Alan Mulally, did you not? When, Alan Mulally. Well, yeah. Alan came in after I left Ford, and I was at Nielsen running the automotive research, and I, I had. In the middle of all that, I'd gone to FCB uh, to run uh, Chrys down the Chrysler Asia Pacific and then ultimately to run two of their offices and run the Boeing aircraft business globally. And Alan Bully was running commercial aircraft at Boeing. So that's how I met up with Alan initially. And then the funniest thing was I started doing work you know, with Nielsen, with Ford, and we were at a pre presentation. We were presenting awards and Alan was ahead of me in the, in the speaker lineup and he looked around in surprise. He said, I know you, but I don't know you from here. And I said, ah. <laughs> so that's how, how it came about. But wonderful man. Uh, he was absolutely the right person at the right time for Ford. Um, he had a really rough time you know, convincing some of the old guard there. And, you know, and he blew a lot of people out with good reason because there were people that would sit in a meeting and agree with everything and then walk out of that meeting and say, I never agreed to that and undermine. And so he blew, up, he blew people like that at Boeing and he blew people like that at Ford quite rightly. Um, but he was the, the book American Icon is a fabulous read. I it is, I've, I've read it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. It, yeah, yeah. And you know, Jim Farley. Um, I worked with Jim when he was in charge of advertising. When I was running uh, Sarge's advertising, he was running Twitter advertising. And I met up with Jim subsequently. And Jim is different to Alan, but has many of the same qualities that Alan had, which is he's the current CEO of yes, Ford. Yeah. Yes, yeah, right. never being satisfied looking and never being complacent. Uh, and that's because, you know, Jim spent 20 plus years with Toyota, so he has that Toyota mindset. Right. Which is what, uh, you know, that is the only way that a company like Ford is going to get out of this boom bust, you know, vortex that they've been in for, for 100 years. So let's see. hundred percent. And then you also uh, Kia Motors. I mean, it's a very yeah. large Korean automotive, a, a really pivotal time when they were expanding massively in the United States. So you were yeah. there as well, at, and again, at a really interesting intersection. Yeah, I had a, that was the first time where I, I got a combination of, um, of, uh, of jobs. So, so I was in charge of marketing, research, uh, product planning and public relations. So you got to look at the, the business holistically and uh, it, was a, it was a very, very uh, wonderful time. It was just as they started to hit their stride in terms of product quality, starting to win IQS awards, starting to go from being the butt of all jokes to being this is where they're going. Uh, incredibly ambitious company. Um, the pace at which the Korean brands move is just extraordinary. You know, it blew me away how quickly they could pivot on product issues. Oh, really? It would take a three out of three years, they do in 20 months um, wow. or 10. Okay. So uh, very impressive. And so um, 
it's a wonderful company to, to work for. Some great people I still am connected, still do work with them. Um, but it was also incredibly invigorating to have a, a company that was just so determined to succeed and was was frankly open to you know a lot of new ideas. The only thing that is different is that the politics of the company were then and are to still some degree very feudal. So when big things had to happen, it came from the top. And so okay. everyone had to, had to salute and salute that flag. If you didn't like it, get out. So it was a bit of feudalness to it, but uh, it's a much more open, um, much different company today than it was back then. But it was it was certainly a very stimulating time for me and um, I really liked working working for Care. It was a really good company. Well, I understand your trajectory. You, you obviously you made many creative decisions. You've taken on tough challenges. You worked for some brilliant executives and leaders, and worked with them and worked for them. And when we had our when we had our conversation a few weeks back, you mentioned that uh, more more things have happened in the auto industry in the last five years than the last <laughs> combined. So maybe we can just put on our prophetic hat here for a mm-hmm. second. What mm-hmm. does the auto industry look like in five or ten years? What, well, what? if well if, if I knew that, I wouldn't be sitting here reading, doing an interview with you, and I'd be making millions and sitting on the beach somewhere. That's right. <laughs> However, um, part of my job is to have have a thought on that. I think there are a couple of things that we need to take into account. Um, I, I'm a volunteer at the Peterson Museum, which is a, you know, one of the best car museums in the world, and they've got a Tesla exhibit they've just opened. Now, they, you know, they're steeped in the 100-plus years of the car industry. However, they've got a Tesla exhibit, and everyone goes, why? Well, I'll tell you why, and this is it's, I'll get to your point because this, this is the continuum we're on, is what, while I'm not a great fan of, the thing on my personal thing, I think he's an ass. Um, you have to admire what he's done in terms of what the Tesla Model S represented. To me and to most people in the industry, when they sit and soberly think about it, the Tesla Model S is the most significant vehicle in the world since the Model T. Yeah. It basically has transformed the industry and it's done it in ways that I don't even think Elon Musk was even thought about because um, it's transformed it in, in terms of manufacturing many things. But it's the first successful auto company in the United States since the 40s. So just think about that for a second. Yeah. And this is a very capital-intensive business, slow-moving, all those sorts of things. And he's made a lot of mistakes and the product quality is not there and we can go on there forever. But that um, leap that he made, as audacious as it was, it took a long time for the car industry to wake up what it meant. They initially thought all it meant was electric cars. And that was not what it meant. What it meant was electrification, which is yeah. fine, but it also meant rethinking manufacturing. It re- meant rethinking software in the car and how software is into the age of the right. car. It had, it's changed the way consumers re- reacted with the product and with the brand. It's, it had so many la- layers of things that it impacted that were never central to what Elon Musk was trying to do. Um, Frankly, one of the things is some of the learnings he's got from SpaceX, which is the company he started because he didn't start Tesla. SpaceX, some of the technologies that they're, in, they're using in SpaceX have come directly across into Tesla. Right. Just as Alan Mulally bought some very, very good ideas from aerospace into Ford that changed their game. So the, uh, I think what it did, it, it's broken up a hidebound industry that says, well, now our industry is different from every other industry. We, you, know, you can't teach us anything to oh, my God, there's stuff we can learn from others. And yeah. that's changed the nature of the business and it's changed the trajectory of the business. And the reason that Elon Musk has the stock price of his company that he does is because it's growing. And if you look at all the other auto companies, they're actually not growing. Mm-hmm. The industry is not growing. Um, you know, some of them are getting a bit more in share, a bit more, you know, and they're making profits, but they're also very short term in, in the way they do things and they've never got the story right for Wall Street. I think that's slowly starting to change. And now that they've woken up to what electric, electric cars promise or electrification promises, the industry is pivoting in a very, very interesting way. You know, we're going to have 159 electrified vehicles introduced in the next two years in the United States. Wow. Electrified. So that's different, a, different types of vehicles. Yes. So it's hybrid, yeah. plug in hybrid, electric, and frankly, fuel cell. Right. That is unprecedented. Yes. And so that's going to transform the industry. But also as part of that, because what, what electrification does, you can't have autonomous vehicles without electrification. You really can't because you need software. You need all of these other things that electric cars make possible much easier. 
you need platforms that can be run in different ways and major flexibility in platforms. So the skateboard flat platform has freed up car design for autonomy that you couldn't do with an internal combustion engine. Right. So the industry has changed more in the last five than it's changed in the previous 50, and it's going to change more in the next five than it's probably changed in this last five. And the, certainly autonomy is going to come along, but it's going to not be the way people feel it is. Level five is a unicorn in the industry because that's where it can be autonomous anytime, anywhere. We're not there. I mean, we may not be there in my lifetime. But we will get to level four. Um, you will, you've got ADAS systems, advanced you know, safety systems now at level two, um, and you'll get level three. That'll, that'll start to become available, and that's affordable. Um, you're going to have software, over-the-air software update. For instance, Polestar. Now, Polestar is a subsidiary of Volvo, old hidebound organisation. They set, put Polestar as a separate brand. Well, Polestar just announced today for $1,100, you can get an upgrade on your Polestar 2 that will increase its acceleration, basically halve the acceleration from 0 to 60 and increase it by about 2.2 seconds from, I think, 40 to 70 miles an hour. And that's, an, that's a car you already had, you've had for two years, and suddenly it's turned into a performance car. For eleven hundred bucks, yeah, so that that is possible because of what's happened in software, and that software development could only have happened with electrification. So there's so the the Musk you know play of the of the Model S was a big play that has many many follow on things that I think were beyond even his thing. And I think the thing that's also important is that his autopilot isn't it's a level two system just like everybody else's with a couple of things that are really dangerous. Um, he still hasn't got to, you know, full autonomy. And, frankly, everyone says that he has, you know, millions and millions of miles because of all the software that's in the car, but he has no way to analyse it. There's actually so much data. So uh, there's no guaranteed winners in this. So I think the industry is going to be incredibly dynamic. And you've then got the Chinese coming, and they are coming at a million mile an hour. And BYD are now the biggest selling electric vehicles in China, passing Tesla, passing everybody. And, in fact, they became the number one selling car of all types in China last month, and when they come to the United States, watch out, because they make their own batteries. They do everything Musk does, and Musk is buying batteries from them. Just think about that for a minute. Wow. And they're into, they've got a full software development update. The product quality, they have gone further in two generations of product than most OEMs go in five. Wow. Okay. So, so the industry is still very dynamic. It's been dynamic for, for over 50, 60 years, right? It's becoming more global. Yeah, but nothing like this. Nothing oh. like this. This is incredible. This is why I'm still working. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And last question. Do you think that's an existential threat, threat to the U.S. auto industry? Or do you think this, is a, this, this might be the best chance the U.S. auto industry has had of reinventing itself and, and, and finding a new, a new chapter? Um, I, th I, I think it's. A, I think, frankly, what's going on is a threat to anyone. I, I don't think there's any guaranteed survivors uh, for many of this. I, I, there are absolutely no guarantees. I will say that um, there are there are elements of the industry. You know, Steiner's, for instance, is, you know, has a US operation, but it's not an American company. It's been, you know, it's a European company fundamentally. Um, and you've got General Motors, which is a US, but you've got Ford, who you know operates globally. You know, GM no longer operates globally. And you've got Toyota, you know, Toyota, Nissan, Honda, uh, who are absolute global companies. So I think, um, it's, I think what you're going to have is globalization, okay. which is it's going to be global, but there's going to be a degree of localization. And again, because it's software and flexible platforms, you can you can do what they call top hats in the industry really easily and very inexpensively on electric vehicles to cater to local needs. So there are some real opportunities here for companies to be much quicker product cycles and to answer consumer needs very quickly. Then the other part of the industry that I didn't talk about that is really going to change is the whole franchising system, which mm -hmm. Musk, as you know, turned upside down. Dealers have fought back with it. The franchise laws in the, in the United States were all by state. However, what uh, is changing is, is, is what's called the agency model, because all of the OEMs with electrification and with software updates have an opportunity to get directly in contact with customers in a manner they've never been able to do before. Mm -hmm. But dealers are sort of in the way. And dealers also add to the cost of the vehicle. There's about $2,000 more in distribution costs through the franchise system per car than there is with the direct sale model. So the agency model is a way to keep dealers, but for the OEM to have control over the stocking of the vehicles, the pricing of the vehicles, and the dealer becomes the, the, the face of the, of the company 
in terms of delivering vehicles, servicing vehicles, used car operations, those sorts of things. And this will transform the customer experience. And now that's happening in, in Europe and in Asia because the franchise laws are different. And what Ford just did with electrification is 65% of Ford dealers have stepped up to the different different model, the agency model for electric vehicles to be part of Ford's future. And there, that is the most ballsy move of any OEM in the United States. And with 65% of their dealers stepping up to that, that could be that could be really the, the tipping point of a change in the franchise model. Amazing, because I know you know you could look at other industries like Coca Cola or the Coke industry or whatever. You know, they, they there's a mixture, some some yeah. control, some 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 outsourced uh, production. But yeah, this is really interesting. Yeah, yeah, huge, wow. huge, huge shift, huge shift.